Okay, so I want to present Professor Henry Matthews, who is doing a lecture from Palladio to St. Paul's. Oh, you can't hear me. Uh, from Palladio to St. Paul's, uh, but I have to warn you that he has some favorite pieces of sculpture that he's added on. Okay, he couldn't resist. Okay, Henry, go. Well, it's fun to be back again. I'm having a good time because I like to go, go to so many of my favorite places. Today's a little confusing because I begin with Palladio, who is still in the Italian Renaissance, and I end up, I come back to him later, and then I end up with the United States Capitol. So let's take a quick look at Palladio. There was a time when the merchants of Venice were very wealthy and relaxed and they wanted to enjoy life in the countryside rather than being in the hot Venice where the canals stank in the summer. Uh, and so he built beautiful houses that were combined with farms. Uh, this is one uh, typical one, Villa Emo, uh, and in the middle is a grand house. You can see it's grand because it has columns and a pediment. And then there are arcades on either side, and behind them are farm buildings. Uh, this was something he did quite often, combining uh, architecturally a residence uh, and uh, a workplace for, for farmers. And he was very influential both in England and the United States. His most famous villa was the Villa Capra, known as the Villa Rotunda, um, outside Vicenza. It was built by a cardinal. I don't know what the cardinal, why the cardinal had so much money, but we better not go <laughs> into that. Or why he, or why he or Palladio thought the reform like this has anything to do with the complexity of life. Uh, why should a house be identical on all four sides uh, when different things are happening in the rooms inside uh, and different things are happening outside? But architectural principles don't always have to deal with utility. Uh, you, you don't have to study much of the history of architecture to see uh, that beauty perfect geometry, proportions, and so on, are more important than convenience. So, here's a closer uh, view of it. Uh, we can see that there's, if we can see from the plan, that there's a temple front portico on all of the four sides, and a dome in the middle. And when we get inside, we see that the Cardinal enjoyed entertaining people of great distinction and taste who would enjoy the painting, the sculpture, the space, the light. I heard a groan from somewhere in the audience. Maybe it's not your idea of where you'd like to live, but... Well, the children enjoyed it. <laughs> the Cardinal's children, yes. <laughs> and because this is such an exemplar of what architecture should be, it had tremendous influence. For example, uh, in England, Lord Burlington uh, had his architect, William Kent, design Chiswick House, which you Pass on the way in from London Airport, you probably passed by it without even knowing it was there. It's slightly lacking because it only has porticos on two of the four sides, but magnificent it is. And Thomas Jefferson, who owned one of the rare copies of Palladio's tome, Four, is it four books of architecture or 12? Uh, 
I'll bet it was 12, I think. Yeah, four books of architecture, a uh, magnificent volume showing how houses could and should be built. And Jefferson spent a long time building and pulling down and building again with a slightly better idea. He ended up uh, with a, a dome in a, just in a room on the upper floor. It's a delightful room. Some of you have probably been there. Um, and you look out over at Jefferson's plantation and you can see the slaves working in the fields around. <laughs> Jefferson uh, was actually very unusual that he raised up or he lowered the ground underneath the house and the servants' quarters occupied an entire floor underneath and that didn't have to disturb the architecture. Then Jefferson pulled off an absolutely marvelous beat in the building of the University of Virginia. Uh, at the end of the lawn uh, is a pantheon-like building, the library. It has the symbol uh, of greatness, the temple portico, and the second symbol, the dome, uh, so we know what its significance is. And then lining the great open space are a series of elegant houses uh, linked by lower wings uh, with rooms for the students in them. Uh, and uh, believe believe you visited that? Uh, I've um, <coughs> Been there a couple of times. It's uh, uh, it's it's really wonderful to a place to see a place uh, that explains what architecture should be uh, so potently. This was influential in the University of Washington in locating the library at the center of things. Yes. Yeah. I like having you come in. So here is the library. I used to have a slide. The only slide I had on the head of the library had a little shack uh, in front of it with a sign on it saying, Free Nelson Mandela. So we can see how far we've come. I'll go back to Rome, uh, and then uh, I will go from there uh, through the Baroque era. Uh, and finally to St. Paul's Cathedral in London. I was just commenting, uh, Henry, that uh, when Ben and Google did the University of Washington plan, they looked to the centrality of the library as a key to their plan. Yes, yes. Well, here uh, is a view of the piazza in front of St. Peter's, and you can see the image of the church reaching out to uh, embrace the people. And uh, Berlini didn't originally uh, intend to have this street continuing on uninterrupted. Uh, I think I sh show that better uh, in uh, the, well, no, if he, was, he wanted people to walk up towards it. See, See the see the dome as they were walking up, and then they would come into what he described as a propylea, uh, which is the entrance to the Parthenon of, of Athens. Uh, and so they would be in a confined space, and then burst out into this huge piazza. Uh, he wants to play with our feelings, and we go down uh, the, the nave, which was lengthened beyond Michelangelo's design and given a delightful baldacchino, a canopy over the altar. And here's a Baroque feature. Why should a, why should a column merely rise sheer and straight? Why couldn't it uh, spiral in this manner? And why couldn't the lines of the canopy uh, have double curves to them? 
and angels blowing trumpets on the corner. So Bernini could create drama, uh, which he did. I think I've already covered. Oh, this this that road was actually built by Mussolini, uh, but the, the the road there was built by 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 Mussolini. Originally, originally, you would make your way through narrow streets. I always enjoyed going to St. Peter's. You you come around the back here, and then you burst through the colonnade, and you find yourself in this enormous space. Now to Borromini. Benini detested him, but I have a soft spot for him. Uh, his church, which we will see first, of San, San Carlo alle, alle Quattro Fontane, uh, is an absolute gem. The four fountains, the Quattro, Quattro Fontane, are in the corners of the, the, the four corners of the square and uh, the church conveniently includes one of them. But look at that facade uh, with its undulating lines. Palladio gave us straight lines of great elegance, but Borromini uh, could give us uh, a jolt uh, with something uh, so unusual and expressive. I'll compare it with a church by Alberti, uh, one of the intellectuals of the Renaissance. Brunelleschi was the craftsman, Alberti the intellectual, and they both represented Renaissance ideas. There's a, a church uh, by Alberti, uh, elegant, straight but straight line, and look what Borromini can do. And the plan is as crazy as the facade, and all power to it for doing that. The walls undulate. The dome, the dome is not round, but heresy, the dome has undulating sides, it's not an ellipse, it's not a circle, it, it's, does this, name, does this geometric form have a name? And I love looking up into that dome and seeing the light coming into different elements of it in different ways. And then the surface is covered with a mixture of octagons and cruciform shapes of different sizes, or the octagons are of different sizes. That's one of the places I always go back to in Rome. I, I miss it. And it all comes to a resolution. <coughs> it all resolves itself in that little bit of light, doesn't it? Yes, it resolves itself in that little bit of light in the middle. And then this is a small cloister. It, you know, it's, it's a tiny monastery with its church and its cloister. But his, another of his churches uh, is at the, at the Church of San Ivo della Sapienza. And this is a university church. It's at the end of a courtyard uh, onto which arcades open. And we look up uh, at the dome, and the lantern, Brunelleschi and Michelangelo did good lanterns, but why not make it into a spiral? <coughs> so there's a section through it, and you can see that the walls are of the lower part and the interior of the dome uh, have complicated surfaces. Looking at the plan, uh, you can see three apses 
um, three dark white apses, odd shaped spaces um, uh, inside. And it's at the top of this spiraling dome, we have the effect of, of a crown, was it flames? And then look how ingenious he's been. But don't consider that this is just sort of random pattern making. And look at this diagram here, uh, which shows uh, two intersecting equilateral triangles and then a semicircle uh, at the point of each at the point of each triangle. And one more Baroque <coughs> masterpiece in Italy. Uh, this is by Guarino Guarini. I wish I had a name like that. <laughs> um, he elongated uh, the dome up and placed, uh, we have these major arches below, four major arches below, and then we have arches stepping on arches, stepping on arches, and going on until uh, we get this sort of crown at the top. And this one is not exactly a spiral, uh, but it's magnificent. He's used those arches to create a sense of infinity. The dome goes on forever inside. That's a very good way to yeah. put it. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. And then just in case you haven't noticed the difference between the Renaissance and the Baroque, <laughs> David by Michelangelo and David by Bernini. David knows he's going to kill Goliath. He's very calm as he fondles the stone in one hand. But Bernini's David uh, is aggressive. But they both worked. So I couldn't resist taking you to the Piazza Navona, uh, although it has no dome. But the, ch the, but the church here by Borromini has a dome. Uh, Benini hated Borromini, um, but he got this plum site. What do you think made this space, that shape, with two rounded ends? It was the Roman circus. And if you think that a circus is supposed to be round, not necessarily so. The circus was the place that was used for chariot racing, and it was long with rounded ends. This is where I want to live, but we'll see. And then the, there's Borromini's church uh, with its two little towers on either side, and we'll come back to them later when we look at the work of Sir Christopher Wren. So this is the Piazza Navona, and in the middle of it, the Four Rivers Fountain. It's hard enough to bring an obelisk back from Egypt, but it's even harder to lift it up onto an unruly base like that. But that's what Bernini was up to. And here are the Four Rivers as we go around it. We have the Danube, gesturing in one way, and the Ganges with his paddle, the Rio Plate, Rio de la Plata in South America, and the Nile. Now, my father-in-law, who was an architectural historian, told me that this one had a towel over his head because he didn't want to see Borromini's church. But actually, it's because we don't know the source of the River Nile. We can't see it. Uh, and so that's why he's blinded. Now, it's hard to leave Rome, but here we are in England. Um, just one example of the kind of house uh, that was built in the time of Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth didn't have much money, so she liked to move her court from one house to another and be entertained by wealthy people. And she came to Hardware Hall rhymingly, more glass than wall. 
Uh, and this more glass, I think I can see more glass than more. Oh, I, I see, oh, right. <laughs> I, I can see the next one on the left, which is confusing. So this is one of the prodigy houses of 16th century England that entertained Queen Elizabeth. Bess of Hardwick, who built it, had four husbands who all could be, they died leaving her fortunes, and this is what she built. Of course, England can be a cold country, but think of the summer, think of having windows like that, and think how small the windows are uh, in Italian Renaissance houses, you can hardly make out any windows on this Palladian villa to its right. So now we're coming to Inigo Jones, one of my favorite characters. He was taken, he, he was an artist, uh, and he had a job designing masks, M-A-S-Q-U-E-S, which were performances at court, and he was, uh, gave a lot of pleasure with that. But gradually he began to get involved with architecture. He was taken to Italy by the Earl of Arundel, uh, who had to have an artist with him. I suppose when you travel, you take an artist along with you uh, in case there are no postcards for sale. But um. there he was. Um, Inigo Jones was particularly uh, amazed by Palladio. Uh, here's the Palazzo Chiricati in Vicenza. Oh, I forgot. Here's the Palazzo Chiricati in Vicenza. Uh, with the normal columns supporting entablatures, but an open walk underneath, and then these two balconies at the end. There's a, that's a fascinating idea, and Inigo Jones was strongly influenced by it when he went back to England. Uh, he designed the banqueting house in Whitehall. <coughs> The palace in London was a rambling mixture of old uh, medieval buildings. Some of them uh, Tudor buildings with wood, uh, some, some of them stone. And this was the first of what was going to be a complete rebuilding uh, of the, the palace. Uh, but uh, that was as far as they got. King James <laughs> died and was succeeded by Charles I, who had some problems <laughs> other than architecture. But look at that building. Every time I go down Whitehall on a bus, uh, I look at the order and symmetry. And, uh, simple, simple simplicity, but we've got a little flourish at the top of the upper story. So there, so there I compare it uh, with the kind of buildings that filled London uh, up to that time. And there's quite a difference. I think those have been completely rebuilt, probably more than once. But the, after the fire of London, uh, they were the only timber buildings left, virtually. And then we come to the inside, no dome, but having a ceiling painted by Peter Paul Rubens with your own apotheosis as you rise up, rise up to heaven is almost as good as a dome. And you can see how different this was from the kind of buildings that royalty lived in before. Uh, I. In my college in Cambridge, I would have my dinner under a ceiling like that. But this is uh, Hampton Court Palace built by Cardinal Wolsey uh, and later confiscated by the king, who was jealous of him. Grant, yes. Uh, the preceding slide, if you could go back one. This had some influence. Some of you know the uh, no Whitman uh, College of Walla Walla. Oh, this had some influence on the music building, which has that lovely interior court, not unlike this. Good, yes. 
Thank you. Well, now we get to St. Paul's Cathedral, and I'll show you uh, as it, as more or less as it is now. The Fire of London, just before the Fire of London, uh, they began to put a slightly more up-to-date West End onto St. Paul's uh, to make it, make it look more contemporary. And then the fire burnt down the entire city, uh, the, the cathedral surrounded by other wooden buildings uh, was almost completely destroyed. They, they thought of trying to use some of what was there, but finally they employed not an architect, but a professor of astronomy who was an amateur architect who had designed one or two small buildings uh, and he talked the talk of architecture uh, to the king uh, and the, the parliament uh, and he got the job. In the next slide, I show this with the church by Borromini, Borromini and Sanagese in Rome, with the dome uh, flanked by two quite tall towers, but it's a smaller dome and much closer uh, than the, the dome of St. Paul's. We see uh, the projecting transepts, so it's like the medieval. Yes. If you see, you can see the transepts uh, projecting at the sides, like the medieval cathedral that preceded it. Uh, the front has a two-tiered portico uh, with, uh, in the classical style. And then the dome, somewhat similar to Bramante's or Michelangelo's dome, but much taller. I wish that I had the pictures of some of the preliminary stages, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I don't. Um, uh, originally it was going to have a spire rather than a dome, uh, but Rembrandt had been to Paris. Uh, he had uh, seen at least one dome there and it caught his imagination. So here is St. Paul's compared with Bramante's dome. No, it's the, this one. This is compared with Michelangelo's dome of St. Peter's. Sorry, sorry, Michael, Bramante, this is Bramante's dome, uh, which had an <coughs> even spread of spacing of columns around it. And it's slightly lower. Uh, it's more like the perfect dome of the Pantheon within which a hemisphere uh, could sit, or an entire sphere could fit inside the Pantheon and fit just perfectly. Um, a rather larger lantern on top. And then here we look at St. Paul's compared with Michelangelo's design. Michelangelo has a slightly more vertical thrust, and he, I think he brilliantly coupled columns between the windows, allowing wider windows uh, and the coupled, the coupled columns uh, line up with ribs on the outside of the dome. But St. Paul's is considerably more vertical. And we could compare it with the dome of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Um, they are quite similar, more similar than Ren to Bramante or Michelangelo. Now, Red was determined not to build a dome that would be overwhelmed by the weight of, of its uh, lantern. And so he built a brick cone, a brick cone which rises up here on two sides, all around, and supports the lantern, which itself 
is absolutely enormous. I mean, that lantern is almost uh, as high uh, as the dome this, uh, from, from where it springs to, to, to here. And then he built an inner dome uh, with a small round opening in it. And on that is painted something that appears to be the structure of the dome. And way down below it, rather than putting it on four arches, which Michelangelo and Bramante did at St. Peter's, he built it on eight arches. So four of the arches uh, lead to the transepts, and four of them uh, just to uh, minor spaces. Renner was accused of loving to create problems in order so that he could, in, so that, so that he could solve them dramatic, uh, dramatically or, or solve, solve them efficiently. And that's what he did here. Could I make a comment? Is yes. Out of place? He, his uncle was the bishop at Ely, and the Ely lantern includes both the side aisles as well as just the main axis. And here, unlike St. Peter's, he's included the side aisles in the dome, apparently working from the model at Ely, that marvelous oh, optic. Oh, I wish I'd, I wish you know. I'd, I'd quite forgotten that. I wish you I'd know. brought a slide you know. of, of, of Ely, another you know. of my you know. favorite places. So we go down this ponderous nave, uh, lined with huge arches, uh, arches uh, going down, uh, separating the aisles uh, from, from the nave, and then arches across the nave, supporting saucer domes, small domes uh, over the nave, and then we reach the crossing I wish that I could have a wider lens, angle lens when I took that picture, but you can see four of uh, the eight arches, and then above them a gallery going around which you can climb up to. And then we look up into the dome around at this level is the Whispering Gallery, which you can walk around. Uh, you can go up in an elevator. And uh, if you lead into the wall, you send your friend to the other side of the dome. You lead into the wall and whisper, and they will hear what you're saying, because it will just slide around the base of the dome. Um, I've. Yeah, I've been way up uh, here. I went, I, when I was taking a course in architectural conservation at the Architectural Association in London, we had a visit to St. Brooks and Balls Cathedral, and I was a bit late, and the cathedral had been closed for some reason, or, or the elevator that goes up here had been closed. And I went out, and I saw that there was a scaffolding up the west front and uh, there was a sort of boards climbing and going up to keep me from getting to the scaffolding. And I jumped and got hold of it and pulled myself up onto the scaffolding with a policeman trying to grab my feet. But <laughs> I cl climbed up the scaffolding and then got up onto uh, this part of the roof. And they were somewhere. And I, it was some time before I found them again. Uh, but that, that was kind of fun. And then we went up in here and climbed right up into, I think we got into the ball on top of the, uh, underneath the cross. We certainly got into that area there. And I looked across the Thames uh, to what is now the Tate Modern, and it was still a power station with smoke coming out of the chimney. So we'll go back inside. Ren also designed a great many churches. I don't remember the exact number, but you wouldn't imagine that there could be so many parishes between uh, the one square mile of the city. I think it was about 30 churches. And 
Benny, he built, he designed many of them. They're all different. If it had more time, I would show you a lot of them. But this is the only one I can think of at the moment with a, with a dome. And this is very ingenious. It, it's a square with, an, with eight arches around it, making make an octagon within the square. And there's a, a, an arch across each corner, and then a, an arch uh, at the east end at the, at the four cardinal points. And then these support what looks like a very light dome. And it's, it's really one of my <coughs> favorite of the, of the city churches. Which one is this? This is, oh, I didn't give it to you. This is St. Stephen's Wall Book. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, you have the name of it. right. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of those churches are open at lunchtime and they play music in them. I've sometimes been to St. Stephen's Wall Book and listened to a string quartet or a choir playing beautiful music, which enhances the architecture. And then Rim differentiated his churches by building spires in many stages. Uh, St. Mary Le Beau uh, is one uh, that has about six tiers before you get to the very top. Uh, he really enjoyed playing games with these architectural forms. Uh, St. Bride's, the next one, is more regular. It looks like a very elongated wedding cake, uh, and uh, even though St. Bride's has nothing to do with marriage. And then those churches had a tremendous influence in this country. Uh, St. Michael's, Charleston, St. Christ, it's a Christ Church, Philadelphia, playing uh, variations on the theme. I'm sure everybody knows St. Martin's in the fields, and it was called that because this was in the fields outside the city of London. And this was designed by James Gibbs, who was one of Wren's assistants. And he had the audacity to combine two completely opposite and different forms. He had absolutely no business doing that, sticking a spire on top of a classical temple. I see Grant sh shaking his head. Yeah. But yeah, somehow it works. <laughs> you, you, can, you, can do, you can do things that are against the rules, but they can be very successful. So here is. The idea, you take yep. a medieval spire and you put it on a Roman temple, but you smooth out the, the, different, the differences uh, so it all fits together in one. And almost every town in New England has a church like that. Before we leave St. Paul's, I wanted to make some comments, but oh. I don't want to interrupt your talk. Well, we can go. Do you want to say something more about St. Paul's? I think we have time. Well, don't go away about it. Okay, when it, whatever, she'd prefer to do it at the end. That's she, the she's that's, the boss. That's, that's well, like, she'd want to get to the end, and then we'll have a look. Yes, that's better. Yeah, that's better. So, um, Nicholas Hawksmore, uh, who was another friend's assistant, more daring uh, and uh, less um, uh, from following the rules, uh, was, is a favorite of mine. This is Christchurch, Spitalfield. Now we come to the United States Capitol, and there was a competition, and some of the entries really show you the architectural talent uh, that there was in the United States at this time, uh, but not everyone was lucky to be uh, selected. I like the one with, I don't know if it's an eagle or, or a... <laughs> Looks more like a vulture, I think. <laughs> oh, I like it. 
But the winning design, which is above here, was by Stephen Hallett. And then, after he had been declared the winner, Dr. William Thornton had no architectural uh, professional experience, but he was an erudite man, produced the design below, which is more solemn and stately uh, than Hallett's design. And Hallett was appointed as his second in command, and they supervised the building of this. Originally, it was to have a dome like the Pantheon, uh, as you see here. Uh, and then Benjamin Trobe and Charles Bullfinch gave it a slightly higher dome. And incidentally, uh, there's a level floor at this point, so you look at, you look up to, into the dome uh, from this level rather, rather than from the ground, which of course is <coughs> much works much better. So this is how it was. Well, it was actually built, wasn't it, and then destroyed in the War of 1812? Is that right? So yeah. Yes. So it was. Very like, very like the Pantheon. And then after the War of 1812, uh, it was given a new design. And I'm glad to see uh, that Americans had some ingenuity. <laughs> I love the corn cob and the tobacco capitals. They're just, who wants an acanthus leaf? <laughs> So this was a magnificent creation, but it was given a higher dome and new wings on either side by Thomas Ustick Walter. And magnificent it was and is. This is in scale, this is a bit of a come down. Uh, this is Baltimore Cathedral, uh, but I wanted to bring it in because it shows that influence of Palladio, the portico on one side and a dome in the middle. The turrets may be at a large scale. That's something that's happened before. Uh, and there's Baltimore uh, Cathedral, very fine indeed, uh, with a domed interior and further than that we cannot go uh, in this century. I will give you one more lecture in this series which will uh, do a little bit of 19th century stuff and some <coughs> incredible architect engineers in the modern era uh, who could go beyond domes. If, if you could do the same thing, we you need to have a perfect dome, we could be more exciting than that perhaps. So we'll see. Well, I'd be glad to answer any questions or listen to more suggestions uh, from Grant. I'd like to go back. I'd like to go back to the exterior of St. Paul's. Is it now? Yeah, now it is. He's still finding it. They're talking to you. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the exterior of St. Paul's, that's report. That one, that's it. There are a lot of, uh, your, your theme was the dome, and this is apart from that, a different question, really. Those, uh, that second story along the sides of the nave is purely a phony wall. Behind that is open space with flying buttresses to support the vaulting. It's, it's just a, a, a masking wall to mask the flyers. And the uh, two-story, if you think about it, it's a very strange composition. You're used to a single facade, and here we've got a building piled on a building. But Ren was very sensitive to the urban setting, and that lower zone is the height of London, 
as it would have been in his time. So the upper part is seen to rise above it as almost a separate building, which I think was a wonderful success in terms of urban sensitivity. Yeah, I used to have a slide uh, of the space between uh, these, these walls uh, and, the, the, and the roof in which you see the flying buttresses. Yes. They couldn't improve on the medieval builders uh, using buttresses of that type. Does anyone have a question? Questions, questions. I just want to make one more comment. I really appreciate your tracing of this story. It's an important one. And thank you for adopting it as a theme. Well, it was fun. It was, I, I thought of it just quickly. And I was said, would you like to give some lectures? Well, what period shall I chose? Maybe I'd be very naughty and go through dozens of periods. And I, I love comparing different times. It's, yes, it's indeed. Fun. Yes, very well done. And uh, I should warn you, if you show up next, some of you showed up last Thursday. Sorry about that. Um, I forgot to mention it. And the, uh, it was in the alert, in the elevators, but we moved to Tuesdays. But we skip next week. Uh, the room was not available. There's so much going on in Horizon House that it's hard to set up something that lasts for several, that wants the same place several days running. But it's going to be on Tuesday in two weeks. And I hope to see some of you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.